Okay, I'm back again. So this is my second uh, screencast PowerPoint on the unit we devoted in the course to studying literary history. And I'm going to just get started. I'll try to make this quick as usual. Okay, partly just because I'm getting tired. Um, it's late afternoon here already and I want to get this on the uh, website for you guys uh, and in email. Okay, so we talked already about the Romantic movement in England, and I want to talk now about how Romanticism came to Russia. This is actually a movement that was international um, and that happened among a, a, a lot of different countries uh, at the same time. We talked about the Romantic period as being the period of uh, modern uh, literature in which modern national poets and national literature began. Um, our idea of a national poet began in this period between about 1750 and 1850. Um, before we go on, let's talk, uh, uh, let's mention a few tips about just studying literary history um, and what we need to do to study history um, from a more rational perspective. Um, the one thing to keep in mind, let's, I'll give you five basic tips about the Romantics. And one thing to keep in mind is that the Romantic movement, like other movements and culture spread unevenly in space. So as we mentioned in the previous PowerPoint, the main centers for Romanticism were in England and Germany. The German Romantics were especially active in the theory and philosophy of it, but the English Romantics were also quite productive, of course, we talked about them. Um, and it actually makes sense if you consider one of the main goals of Romanticism, which was to try to bring modern literature up to the same level as classical literature. In other words, to say that we moderns can uh, perform just as well in our literary culture as the ancients. Um, of course, it's much more difficult to do that if you speak a language that's descended directly from Latin. So that would be all the languages spoken in the old, or not all of the languages, but most of the languages spoken in the old Roman Empire, French, Spanish, Italian, and so on. So it makes sense that the Romantic movement was mainly focused in England and Germany, which were not languages, English and German, that were descended already from classical culture. The other thing related to this is that uh, literary movements like Romanticism spread unevenly in time. We touched on that at the very end of the last PowerPoint or last screencast. Um, when you name a, any era in literary history and put a date on it, you're gonna find scholars who disagree on whether it began earlier or whether it began later. I've been saying 1750 to 1850. A lot of scholars will say, no, I actually began later than that ended earlier. Um, but the answer basically depends on where you were. Um, Russia, for example, really only had writers beginning to identify themselves as romantics in the 1820s, by which time the movement was way past its prime uh, in places like Germany and England. Um, so that also happened in America. We got our American uh, romantics like Edgar Allan Poe in the 1840s. Um, so it happened unevenly in space and also unevenly in time, like most such movements. Um, another uh, tip is that when we study the past, it always looks a lot simpler than it did to the people at the time. And you have to imagine, for example, how your great grandchildren will look back on the year 2020 and think, oh, they had it so easy back in those days, the year 2020. Life was simpler back then. Well, of course, every generation says that about the past. And when we look back at an era like Romanticism, it sometimes seems uh, really easy just to classify all the poets as romantics. But just as today, it was not so clear at the time. And in fact, some of the poets that we would automatically call romantics today, like Goethe or Pushkin, um, actually really had a lot of difficulty calling themselves that. So uh, it was a lot more complicated uh, to the people who lived through it than it is uh, to the people today. It's also true, of course, to poets today who get a label like your postmodern or your postcolonial. Um, often it they are not so happy with that label um, uh, and it's more complicated than it seems. Okay, another thing for studying literary history is just to keep in mind that reputations change. It's not always the same figures throughout history who, uh, who dominate. Um, and this is especially true in our era of mass literacy where we have so many different tastes and schools and backgrounds and traditions that are coming into contact with each other. 
Byron is a great example because Byron was so famous. He completely dominated all of the poetry of his time. But today he's about equally famous with Keats and Blake. How did that happen? Well, to be famous, you got to be in tune with the fashions uh, and fashions change. So sometimes uh, if you're not so fashionable, but you're sticking with your own muse, you can outlive fashion. And that happens in poetry. It also happens in pop music. You know, what happened to disco? Uh, but at the same time, there are pop musicians who just did their own thing and uh, you still uh, listen to them today for that reason. Um, and then finally, another thing to keep in mind when studying literary history is um, that some things are universal. So when we think about the Romantic movement, we can think about it in this very academic and scholarly way, where we say it happened in a certain time in a certain place, and uh, these were the people who did it and so on. But we can also think of Romanticism as we can with almost all uh, movements of this kind as a kind of uni or kind of being based on a universal principle. And there are just things that are romantic. We understand that there was a sort of spirit behind the movement that outlived the actual uh, historical era in which it was founded. So, you know, is Petrarch romantic or Tchaikovsky or those vampires in Twilight? Yes, they're all romantic, right? So, uh, of course, they're not romantic in the historical sense, but there's a sort of universal romanticism that is involved with them. So these are all sort of things to keep in mind um, when you're studying literary history. Okay, now let's just talk about the Russians and we'll try to do this uh, fairly quickly. When we're talking about uh, how romanticism came to Russia, uh, we need to talk about the history of Russian uh, nation building and Russian uh, cultural development. And that really begins with Peter the Great. Uh, Peter was the first Russian Tsar to notice that the West had become considerably better developed and wealthier than, uh, than Russia, and to begin a, a crash program to get Russia to compete with the West. A lot of this was political and economic and military, maybe even most of it, but there was also a cultural project involved. All of it was, by the way, associated with the city of Petersburg, the cultural, the economic, the military, uh, and the political, uh, which is the reason why Petersburg, even to this day, is kind of the cultural capital of Russia. The cultural project involved development in education and writing and music and literature, poetry, painting, uh, and, and, and all these aspects uh, in which Russia was trying to come up to the level of development of Western European countries. In literature, there were a number of important people, lots of them. One of them was Nikolai Karamzin. Nikolai Karamzin uh, was part of this effort uh, to promote literature in Russia. He did that by founding journals, by writing the first really modern history of Russia, um, uh, by promoting ideas similar to Wordsworth's, for example, that poets in Russia really need to to uh, write the same way they speak and speak the same way they write, okay, to write, to make poetry that sounds more natural and appropriate to the Russian language. There were poets like Derzhavin, probably the best or one of the best before Pushkin. And there were other educators and uh, enlightened people like uh, Lomonosov, for whom Moscow University is named and so on. Um, in the West, in Russia, but also throughout uh, romantic era, translators were absolutely crucial. This is one of the reasons that Kazakhstan is so interesting to me as somebody who studied translation, who does a lot of translation, um, because uh, in the romantic era, translators really played a crucial role in all of the romantic countries, but also especially in Russia. So we usually say that romanticism begins in Russia with a translation, and that is Vasily Zhukovsky's uh, 1802, translation of Elegy written in the country churchyard, which is an English poem. And that poem, which in Russian is called Selskoya Pokladbisha, is usually considered to be the first romantic poem in Russia. Um, uh, from translations to originals is really the way that, uh, that uh, the culture develops. And we saw this in, uh, as well in Simbat's um, Flipgrid videos, yeah? Um, so, Somebody like Zhukovsky essentially translated massive amounts of uh, literature from German and English, especially German, and uh, these be created models for, for which Pushkin would come along and then say, I can do an original poem just like that. And essentially, Zhukovsky chose Pushkin to be the guy to do this. Uh, if there is one person behind the fact that every city in the old Soviet Union has a Ulitsa Pushkina, and at least one Pamyatnik Pushkina, probably two or three, uh, it is 
Vasily Zhukovsky, because Zhukovsky was really the guy who promoted this idea that Pushkin was the national poet and that he symbolized the development of the Russian language to the level uh, where it was really equal to and competitive with um, Western languages like French and English. Um, of course, when we Westerners think of Russian literature, we usually think of prose writers. Uh, but, uh, and that's because these Russian romantics really succeeded in their project of bringing Russia up to uh, a level equal with the West. So we think of Tolstoy, we think of Chekhov, we think of Dostoevsky, we think of Turgenev. Why do we think mostly of prose writers? Because poetry is so damn hard to translate. Um, nonetheless, it does play an important role in the development of literature. Uh, the romantics, uh, the romantic, uh, Russian romantics were affected by political events as elsewhere. Um, Pushkin was 13 years old when Napoleon invaded uh, Russia in 1812. And of course, the Aryol culture in Pushkin's time was French. So when Russia was invaded uh, by Napoleon, it actually really promoted the idea from people in the Reshka culture, namely Russian, to try to promote their own culture. And for models for this, they went to Germany and England where he found lots of romantics. So the romantic movement really came in partly under political pressures. The Great Patriotic War of 1812, uh, this is a great story. The uh, Napoleon, of course, burned Moscow and fled back to Paris. And the Russian soldiers in the summer of 1813 chased him all the way back there. It's where the French get their word bistro, meaning a cafe. Um, it was actually uh, comes from Russian soldiers who were sitting in Paris in the summer of 1812 telling the uh, Buistra, buistra, uh, that's where the word bistro comes from, the French word. Um, as the Russian soldiers came back from Europe, they brought a lot of ideas from that era, revolutionary era of romanticism. And uh, these ideas uh, created a challenge to the Tsar and the monarchy, uh, which defined a lot of the era at the time, the politics. It came to a head in the December Street Revolt of 1825. It wasn't that much of a result of, of a revolt. It was put down pretty quickly. But um, the Decembrists were, many of them were sent, interestingly enough, to Central Asia and Sibir. And uh, they are responsible for the founding of a lot of the universities uh, here, for example, in Tomsk. Um, so the Decembrists actually wound up playing quite an important role in uh, Siberian and Central Asian culture. Uh, of all the romantics, of course, the one that's most famous is Pushkin, although Pushkin, uh, as I said before, had sort of conflicting ideas about romanticism. By the time we got to Lermontov, though, uh, who was a big Pushkin admirer, um, we had really openly declared romantics in Russia, and Lermontov had no trouble calling himself a romantic he really believed himself to be. You can see that although he says Yanib Byron, in fact, obviously he was very deeply influenced by Byron and was thinking about what the relationship is between himself and other romantics. Um, we talked about this one, let's skip it because nobody liked it. <laughs> okay, we'll uh, just end with a general point, which is of course, it's the same in England as in Russia. Besides the big influencers, the Lermontovs, the Pushkins, there are also a lot of smaller figures that you uh, discover as you uh, re research on uh, this era. And people like Baratinsky, Gnedich, Delvig, uh, Gnedich uh, translated the Iliad, for example, into Russian for the first time. These guys had a, a really big role in creating Russian literature and bringing it up to a level where it can honestly say that it's as good as anything that is going on in Western Europe. Okay, that brings us to the end. I think we have just about enough time. I have to stop and thank you for putting up with this. I know I sound tired because I am tired.